An important concept when you're studying about recursion is the idea of tail recursion. With tail recursion, our method is not going to perform any additional computation after the recursive call completes. Essentially, we're going to bring the result with us forward through the recursive calls. So here's an example of a recursive Java method. Here, notice in this line, after we get the result of fact of n minus 1, we multiply it by n to get the factorial of n. So we're waiting around for this function to complete before we finish doing the computation in the calling method. Now with tail recursion, since we're not doing that additional work, when we reach the base case, the result of our function is known. And we'll see an example of a tail recursive function. But the real advantage there is that many compilers can optimize tail recursive calls to eliminate a lot of the overhead that occurs when we have a typical recursive function. So here's an example of a recursive function, this time in Python. Because recursion is not limited to Java or C or anything else. We use recursion a lot of the time in a functional language like Scheme. We can also use it in a multi-paradigm language like Python. So even though the syntax may not be familiar to you if you haven't seen Python before, what this function is doing should make sense. This function takes two parameters, an array and a target, and returns true or false based on whether or not the target appears in the array. So the first thing we check, if the array is empty, then we return false, because target can't be in an empty array. If the first element is target, then if the target is the first element of the array, then we return true. And then finally, if the array is not empty, if the target isn't the first element, then we look in the rest of the array for the target. And what this syntax does in Python is gives us the array from element one to the end of the array. And that's actually why I chose Python here, because to do something like this in Java, you could call it the subarray method. In C, you would have to have additional parameters for the first and last indices that you want to consider. But the main focus here is when you look at this method, you should see that as soon as we hit the base case, we know the result of the function. We know it's going to be true or false. Once we, in a sense, throw the computation over the fence here by making the recursive call, we know that we don't need to do anything else other than see what this result is. When you call this method, it's either going to determine that the array is true or false, or it's going to leave that decision up to the recursive call. We don't do any work in the calling function after the recursive call is made. And that's what makes this tail recursive. So we're going to see three examples in this video. The first will be factorial. Then we'll see a made up toy example. And then we'll see a function that computes the numbers up to n. So our first example will be what we call a naive recursive version of the factorial function. And that naive recursion just means it's a more direct translation from the mathematical recursive function into code. And we'll contrast that with the tail recursive version. So in this method, we check if n is less than or equal to 1, we return 1. Otherwise, we return n times n minus 1 factorial. So let's suppose we want to calculate factorial of 4. According to the method that we just saw, this is equal to 4 times factorial of 3. So now we need to calculate factorial of 3, which according to the method is 3 times factorial of 2, which is 2 times factorial of 1. And now that's our base case. So we know that factorial of 1 is equal to 1. Now we're going to return 1, and now we can calculate factorial 2, which is 2. We can calculate factorial 3, which is 3 times 2, which is 6. And now we can calculate factorial 4, which is 24. Now you'll notice we're making all these recursive calls out until we get to the base case. Then we return a value that we do some additional work with to ultimately find the value we're looking for. And the key thing to notice here is that this 4 is waiting on all of this work to get done before we can multiply it by whatever the result is of factorial 3. So here's our tail recursive implementation of factorial. And it's going to call a helper function that has two parameters. And that second parameter is the secret weapon for our efficient calculation of the factorial. Because notice we start off with the base case being that parameter. And then as we move forward in this recursion, we're calculating the partial result each time we make a recursive call. Now that might not make sense to you just looking at the source code, but let's trace through it and see what happens. So fact tail is going to call fact tail for one. That's how it calls the helper method. That in turn is going to call fact tail three, four. That's n minus one 
and that's f times n. That's going to call factorial 2, 12. 2 is 3 minus 1. 12 is 3 times 4. That's going to call factorial 124, because 1 is 2 minus 1. 12 is 2 times 12. And now notice we have found 4 factorial. We're bringing it along with us as we compute the factorial. Our compiler could at this point optimize this method and say, hey, you don't have to do this long series of returns. You can just return this value to the original caller because we know exactly what the answer is. We don't have to unwrap the recursion. So to demonstrate in a more abstract way how this works, we're going to tell the story of two chefs. So the first chef is going to be Noah, the naive recursive chef. And Noah wants to make some gingerbread, but he has a problem. He doesn't have any molasses. So no gingerbread for Noah. However, Noah minored in computer science at culinary school. So he came up with a method to figure out how he could get some molasses. And what he's going to do is he's going to check to see, does his neighbor have molasses? And if so, great. Otherwise, he's going to ask his neighbor to get some molasses from their neighbor. And they'll continue executing this procedure until somebody finally has some molasses. So let's trace through this. So here's Noah, and here he is walking down his street. So he comes to the first house. Do you have any molasses? No. So that person asks their neighbor, do you have any molasses? No. That person asks their neighbor, but they don't have any. They ask their neighbor, who asks their neighbor, who asks their neighbor, who asks their, ask their neighbor, who does finally have some molasses. So they take it from their neighbor. And notice now the neighbors pass back the molasses in the order they came. And then finally, Noah's neighbor gives them the molasses and Noah is able to cook his gingerbread cookies. So that would be how recursion works. You say, I need to get this result. You throw the problem to your neighbor, let them figure it out. And then once they return to you with the solution to their problem, then you do what you need to do to complete what your goal is. So the other chef is Talia, the tail recursive chef. She also minored in computer science in culinary school, but she remembers that tail recursion is more efficient. She still wants to make some gingerbread cookies, but she also doesn't have molasses. But her process to get the molasses is different. Her get molasses tail method is going to have a parameter that's a measuring cup. And she's going to take the measuring cup along with her and ask, does your neighbor, do you have any molasses? If they do, she'll fill her measuring cup and return those contents. Otherwise, she'll try to get molasses from the neighbor of whoever's house she's at, again, bringing her cup along with her. Here's how that works. Talia asks her neighbor. Her neighbor doesn't have any, so she goes to her neighbor's neighbor and then to their neighbor, to their neighbor, to their neighbor, to their neighbor, and to their neighbor. And this is the neighbor who has the molasses. So now Talia has molasses. She doesn't have to wait for all the neighbors to pass it back house to house. Now Talia can go directly home, make some gingerbread cookies, and share them with the entire neighborhood. So let's see another example of a tail recursive Java function. So first, let's look at the naive version, which is here. And we're going to sum the numbers up to n. So when we pass n as a parameter, if it's less than or equal to 0, we'll just return n. And otherwise, we'll add n to the sum of the numbers up to n minus 1. And you'll notice this has a very similar structure to factorial but hopefully you can kind of see how the tail recursive function works. So just as a review, the way this is going to work is 4 will call sum up of 3, which calls sum up of 2, which calls sum up of 1, which calls sum up of 0. That returns a base case of 0, and now we can start adding up sum up of 1 is 1, sum up of 2 is 3, sum up of 3 is 6, and then finally that returns 6 to our original calling function, so it can add 4 and 6 to get 10. And you'll notice a lot of calculation has to get done, and our function has to wait around. Our tail recursive method is going to call a helper method that's going to pass in an initial value, 0. Then, while n is not less than or equal to 0, we're going to subtract 1 from n and add n to our total thus far. That execution will look like this. Sum up tail 4 will call sum up tail 4, 0, which will call sum up tail 3, 4, because 4 is 4 plus 0. That was our initial parameter. And then sum up tail 3, 4 calls sum up tail 2, 7. Notice we're subtracting 1 from n, adding n to x, which is our sum up to that point. Sum up tail 2, 7 calls sum up tail 1, 9. Again, subtracting 1 from n, adding 2 to x. And then finally, sum up tail 1, 9. Whoops, 
we have a little bit of an error there. Sum up tail 1, 9 calls sum up tail 0, 10. 0 is our base case, so we just return x, and that gives us 10. So here's a comparison of how the two methods execute. Notice with our naive recursive function, our initial value is sitting here waiting to be combined with the result of the recursive call, whereas here we take our solution along with us and build it up as we make more and more recursive calls. So hopefully this helps clarify a little bit about how tail recursion works. So typically tail recursion isn't as clear in your code as a naive recursion would be, but almost always it's going to be more efficient.